Good morning. I'm Daryl Ehrlich, and this is uh, Vietnam Voices on August 26, 2015, at uh, about 9.30 in the morning. And today I am joined by Ralph McKinney. Thank you for being here, Ralph. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for for being willing to share your story. So we start at the beginning, which is what was la- what were you doing before uh, – before Vietnam, before your your time in the service, tell me tell me your background. Well, of course, after high school, I I worked went to college uh, for about four quarters. I went first year out of high school, I went one quarter, and then worked the second year. I went the whole year, and and I just couldn't really decide what I wanted to do with my life. And I was working with a guy that had been in the Marine Corps, and uh, he kind of told me all these war stories. And I, well, that sounds exciting, so <laughs> I went ahead and joined the Marine Corps. Now you joined in sixty four. Yep. September 64. September 64. So Vietnam, we have advisors over there, but we didn't commit combat troops until 65. So did right. you know Did you know what you were getting into? No. At that point, they didn't. There's not wow. much talk of Vietnam, no. Right. Right. So there's no war. Korea's over, correct? Right. right. So what did you think the Marines was going to be like? Uh, what, what were you expecting? Well, uh, it's different when I went in than, than it is today. Uh, I went in, and you just went into boot camp, and you took a battery of tests when you're in boot camp. And when you got done with boot camp, then they told you what you were going to be. You know, mm-hmm. today uh, these young, which is good, the young kids can say, "I want to be in com. I mean, I want to be a tank driver. I want to be a truck driver. I want to be in. Commun- you know, they got some choice. Uh, that was there was nothing. You just you just took what they needed at the time. And I got into electronics. They sent me to electronics school. I went to. Uh, almost a year of electronic schools, and I was in radio relay, which is basically microwave radio. Yep. And that's what my job was in Vietnam, was communications from one place to another. So you uh, uh, what? So you thought you were going to be going and training radio stations somewhere, but in a peacetime setting? Well, at, the at time, that time, yeah. yeah. When, when I got done with school in uh, De- uh, yeah, December of 65, uh, they sent me to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, Okay. And I was stationed there in a, just a regular unit, c- communications outfit. And uh, come that summer is when Vietnam started heating up, and then they started taking people to go to Vietnam. And I was chosen there. Well, I, I volunteered, actually. I was one of the first ones. I, ever, I happened to be standing in the right place, and they were looking for some people. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And so Right. So what was, so you were one of the first, you were some of the first wave that went over there. Well, what was that like? Let, let's well, talk about what that was like. Well, actually, you know, the first Marines landed there in 65. It was actually the ninth, some of the ninth Marines, which I was attached to when I got there. And then I uh, got there in 66, October okay. 66. What was Viet? What, I, what do you remember about just let, let's 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 talk about where you where you shipped off from the U.S. at and what what was your first kind of impression of Vietnam? Well, first of all, in the Marine Corps at that time, before you went to Vietnam, you went to Camp Pendleton, California, and you went through what they referred to as staging battalion. Okay. Okay, and all that was was an indoctrination to Vietnam, uh, training, a lot of shots. Uh, just all that kind of stuff. You know, told you about the different things to expect over there. It was, I think we were there about a month. So uh, would it, would, uh, give me an example of some of the things that they they tell you that you prepare for. Can you, do you remember well, that? Oh, yeah. They, they showed you, you know, the different booby traps that they would be using and the different things like that. And, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the, the, the funniest thing I always remember about staging battalion was uh, right at the end of staging battalion, they marched the whole unit, you know, they just break up in units. And we marched up to the medical facility. And this medical officer, he comes out, and there's a big porch thing, and he stands out there, and he's, okay, raise your right hand. And he says, extend your index finger. He says, okay, bend it. And everybody did. And he says, okay, your trigger finger works. If nobody has any special problems, you're done. <laughs> oh, that was, the, that was the march. Well, uh, that was the end of the thing. I mean, we right. had a lot of physical. I mean, if you had any problems, you could step forward. But I just, for some reason, that stuck in my mind, you know. Your tri- <laughs> right, trigger finger works. That's yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. And then so from Pendleton, you spent about a month, and then, then the, did you ship out? Then we, fl- then we flew. I went up to El Toro, which is the Marine Corps Air Station. They took us up there, and we flew from there to uh, Okinawa. And then uh, in Okinawa, there was a few more shots. We was only there about a day. And you stored all your dress uniforms and all that kind of stuff in Okinawa so that when you went to Vietnam, all you took was 
you know, utility type uniforms. Right. And we were there like a day, and then we flew from there to Da Nang, and and then in Da Nang they assigned me to what unit I was with, and uh, then they took me out to Hill Five Five, was where the Ninth Marines were at the time, and right. that's where I started. <laughs> so, what was uh, what do you remember about flying into Da Nang, and what was that like? Oh, it was, I don't know, it was hot and, you know, it was, it was new, it was exciting, but yeah. yeah. Da Nang was, wasn't too hot of an area at that time, so I mean, that right. was okay, but yeah, it was, you know. Now you'd, and you'd been in the south at Camp Lejeune, so you yeah. were used to humidity oh, and all of that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, so that, that wasn't really something. Uh, and then you went up, well, where's Hill 55 and in? It's what, south what it? and, and west of Da Nang. Okay. And I don't know if you've probably heard of all the hills in Vietnam. Did anybody ever tell you what that all meant? No. 55 means it's 55 meters above sea level. Pretty. Okay, okay. I, uh, that's good <laughs> yeah. to know. Yeah. I've heard about Hill, or hill 82, Hill yeah, 88. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's all it is, is just how high it is above sea level. Huh. That's, that's, that's the way they did it. Wow. And so what was, uh, when you got there, uh, what do you, you, you arrived, how long did it take, and then what were your first impressions of Hill 55? Well, it was interesting, you know, it was just a, a big spread out over this hill, and then, you know, they had some hooches there, and we lived there, and that's where the radio relay, but of course I was, you know, got to know the people, got to know, and I was only at Hill 55 a short, short time, and then they sent me to Ann yeah. with where I was attached to the 3rd Battalion, 9th Marines. Uh, Ann Waugh was a little bit more south and west and uh, what it was seeing my job in radio relay we were provided like i said communications from one place to another and there was always three of us at a location okay. there was there was two operators and a technician that was my job as a technician because i'd been you know to the school for it and then that's what we did we kept that equipment running 24 7 that was that's what we did that was right. it. and it was powered by little generators and keeping the generators running was a big part of our problem too. Cause, yeah. Let's yeah. talk about uh, what did it take to keep these generators running? And I mean, yeah, there was a lot of maintenance because you know there's the dirt, the dust, you know, and they wore out, and you'd have to work on them and try and keep them running and yeah. things like that. So yeah. are you? I imagine you're pretty good with a small engine. Well, I'm not real good, but <laughs> we got where we could. You know, they had guys that did higher echelon maintenance, but on site you had to keep them going, and then. You know, you run them so many hours and then you're changed. So every four hours you go out there and start the other one, switch it over and, you know, keep switching back and forth all the time. Right. Some places we got where we had a, a bigger power source and then we didn't have to do that. But most of the time we had to run on them. See, the radios run on uh, 400 cycle AC rather than 60. So the generators were 400 cycle, you know, and if there was 60 cycle AC, we had to get an inverter to invert it to 400 cycle to use it on our radio. So consequently, uh, uh, you know, we didn't have, that's all the power we had. Right. We could light a light bulb off of it, but that was about it. But there was, I mean, most of the places I was, there wasn't much power. Right. I mean, there was, a, like Hill 55 had one generator for the hill. That was it. There was no I mean, they provided their own power that way, and and so you could run some light bulbs and stuff, and and it was maxed out, so you really had to uh, watch what you did with power. Huh. I know uh, we had a little issue. Uh, for some reason, I don't know where we come up with it, but somebody come up with an iron like you iron your clothes. Yep. Well, we used it. We tipped it over, and we used it to fry stuff on. That's what we used it for. <laughs> but, of course, I don't know if you mess with iron. They, they consume a lot of electricity. Right, especially on startup. Yeah. yeah, so we had to really watch it so that they didn't catch us. <laughs> somebody watch, somebody cook. But we could get, like, spam and stuff at the PX. Right. We'd fry that up on the iron. I don't know. It just seemed kind of wow. kind of unique. But <laughs> well, so you uh, you had to make do. That was life. Yeah. That was life in the on hills. Yeah. Hills yeah. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, like at Amwa, all we had was sea rations. That's all we ate there. Right. Some places had mess halls. Most places, we just ate sea rations. Let's talk. So, what was life like on a diet of sea rations? <laughs> well, at first, well, you know, there's 12 meals at right. the time. There's 12 different I ones, see. and you know, it was a little bit of variety. But after a while, you know. It, boils down there's about three or four you like to eat and and then of course you're you're sharing this with other guys so you know you everybody had to take their choice some days and some things like ham and eggs chopped and ham and lima beans they got you couldn't even and of course you didn't eat near as much either you just got where you 
I mean, one or two meals a day, you just, that's all you wanted. It was, especially when the heat, you know, you didn't. Yeah. Lost yeah. a lot of weight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how much did, did you weigh when you went in, and how much did you weigh when you came out? Oh, I don't remember. I come back, I don't know. I probably lost 15 pounds over there. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, when you, uh, what, what was an average day like for a radio technician in the Marines? Well, if you're on a location, it was just, you know, change the generators, keep things up. If you had anything go down, you had to keep that up, make sure all your... It, uh, the, it was pretty primitive microwave. It uh, had eight circuits is all it had, eight voice circuits. And they went back to, I know there was a picture on that PowerPoint, I don't know if you know, but of a switchboard. That went back to a switchboard, and that switchboard spread out to every place in that camp on wire lines. So then the wire lines went into the switchboard, and if they wanted to call the next camp, that operator had to hook up through us on a circuit to the next camp, and everything had a call sign, like we were senator. And then, you know, if you wanted to go to the next place, like uh, one of them I know was called fertilizer. Well, if you wanted to go to fertilizer, you had to tell the operator, and then you'd get the operator at that camp, and then you'd hook up to them. And then everybody had a kind of a common number, like 5-2 is radio relay, no matter where you were. If it was senator, 5-2, fertilizer, 5-2, whatever, you know, and the commanding officer, the chaplain, everybody had a number. It was a pretty, it was a basic system, but it worked. Yeah. Yeah, so what did you... Uh uh, when you're at these bases, uh, is it just are, are you on call 24 7? Oh, what, yeah. What, what were you? Yeah, what, somebody what was, was always. Daily life? Was yeah, every day. I mean, every day, all day. You were, somebody had to be around and awake, and, you know, and the, the other guys could do whatever. And, but, Did you sleep much? Oh, yeah. We, well, not just at night, but I mean, we didn't. During the day, you'd, you know, you'd have the normal duties of trying to take care of laundry and and uh, shower and there was that was another thing showers were most of the places there was you know some places that we had a barrel of water right some places they did have showers that they'd run so much a day but that was only part of the time a lot of the times you just get wet with the pouring water over you and then soap up and rinse off you know that was a, but you, you know you did it you got by right what did you, uh, sight, sounds, smells, you know, sensory is a really powerful memory. What do you remember sight, smells, sounds about Vietnam? Well, I don't, sights, I just, I don't know how to explain that. I guess I really don't have any particular real strong, but, uh, you know, I mean, when, there was always the noise of things going on in the generator. That's another thing, like us with our generators, you know, if one of them quit, I mean, you knew it instantly. Right, you yeah. heard it, you were just, it was always, yeah. you were always listening in the background? Yeah, it was always in the back of your your, yeah. your your mind. Were you a target because you were a communications operations center? Oh, I don't know. I suppose to some degree that antenna sticking up probably. Right. I, you know, I didn't go out in the bush or anything. I wasn't like an infantry person, but, right. but we did take a lot of incoming uh, as you've seen from the antennas and right. stuff, and I had—I mean, I know several people on the wall, and and I, a lot of my friends, were, you know, got wounded. Some yeah. worse than others. But. What was that like? What, what? How do you survive in that kind of environment? As far as just daily, you know, knowing that any time you might. Oh, you're, you're always. You're always. On guard. Yeah, you're always listening. You know, you know, yeah. and the, that's one sound you'll never forget is that incoming, the whistle, that incoming round. Right. I mean, you, you can hear that. And <laughs> you so, so, it, so there is that whistle. It's oh, not yeah. just the sound effect on yeah. movies. Yeah, no, it, it doesn't. So then you were, you got in a hole or in the bunker or something like that, you know. Right. Yeah. How often did that happen for you? Oh, it all depended. Uh, sometimes they would, it would be almost daily. Sometimes it would go for a week or so without nothing. It, it, it all depended. I guess what what was going on. Was there a time of day it happened? Did they do more night or did they? Did oh, happen? mostly it was at night. I, yeah. See, the bad thing was like in Dong Ha, they could fire from the other side of the DMZ. Right. So they could then they were in caves where they could come out, shoot three or four rounds or five or whatever number. Right. And then they go back in their cave and go back to sleep, and then then you're you're wide awake, you're you're right. you're fired up, you know. Right. And then it was impossible for our artillery to return fire because they didn't have a target, you know. Right. 
right. Right. Was that that must have been kind of frustrating? Well, yeah. 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 And and what uh, when you're all fired up like that, do you get back to sleep or do you? Not for a while. <laughs> it takes a while. Exactly. You know, later on, the more you're around it, I guess you kind of accustomed to. But no, at first you were right. wide awake then. Right. So you did you did radio technician over there for yeah. was it a year or two? I, I've the, the tour for a marine was 13 months. Okay. That's what you went for. 13 months tour duty. Okay. And uh, and so in those 13 months, how do you think uh, you did you change in those 13 months? Oh yeah. Yeah. In what yeah. ways? Well, a lot more appreciative, a lot more aware of things. Uh, you know you. you seeing what can happen and what you know and you and you uh, establish some very very close friendships you know you're living with these guys 24 7 you know i mean you get to know these guys pretty good yeah. we even when we get together with our reunions it's just like we're back together again you know yeah. it's, it's amazing it really is i the first reunion we had was in 2005 in branson and that was the most uh, exciting because uh, this was the first time we'd seen each other in 40-some years, but it's still fun every time we get together. We're, we're going to—in fact, I go uh, the 16th of September, I'm going to San Antonio for another reunion. Yeah. Uh, It's—when you go, uh, 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 what are the conversations like, and what do you remember when you all sit together? Oh, you know, people talk about the, you know, the different people, the different times, uh, the different things like that. We always— uh, we always have a little uh, picnic, kind of a ceremony, and uh, try and read off and remember the names of those that were killed and stuff. And well, you know, everybody. There's some talk about you know the good times and all the different people and all the funny things. And yeah, it's it's fun. Yeah. Is it uh, after 40 years? Uh, does the context change? Do you do you feel differently, or or ha has per have perspectives changed? No, not really. I mean, yeah, some of it's. Still just there. like you were still there, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you were over there for uh, 13 months. Uh, what is? You weren't necessarily running the. You didn't run the radios, the actual communication. You just made sure they were, they were serviced, they were running and operational. Yeah, yeah. And then if something failed, well, then you had to get that unit repaired and get get it back up again. How hard was uh, how hard was that? Well, you know, just like anything else, some things were pretty simple. And then a lot of times it was getting spare parts and stuff, you know, was a problem. Then you'd have to try and run them down or, or whatever, and, or maybe you'd have to go get one or something like that. Like sometimes, you know, that was part of... See, I wasn't on a, a radio relay location all the time. I was there most of the time I was there. But in between, you know, you'd be doing duty, like working on equipment, or you'd you'd fill sandbags or, and some people had guard duty and some people had mess duty and you know in between they kind of rotated you around I'd say probably over 80 80 to 90 percent of the time I was on a location but the other time in between you know you were doing other things right and one of the things that I've noticed that, that you showed me is you have a lot of pictures of, of kind of just uh, what it looks like you have some of going out uh, seeing how people lived how did you interact with people who actually lived in Vietnam? Well, I didn't didn't really interact with the with the people too much because I wasn't. I mean, we rode through and we seen them, you know, and stuff like that. And then there was the the people that at the edge of most camps there was they had a little commercial area for the Vietnamese. That's where they sold like these sandals. Uh, you could get haircuts there. They could you could get laundry done and a few other little trinkets you could buy. That's probably the most I had to do with it. And then when I was at An Hoa, Vietnam, we were set up, the 3rd Battalion, 9th Marine was by the airstrip, and we were about a half a mile away in, in an Arvin compound, the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese Army, because it was higher ground. Of course, we're line of sight radio, so you have to be at a high point. Right. So we were set up, and there was three of us Marines and two Army advisors, and the rest were all Vietnamese. And so that was interesting. We we interfaced with them a lot. You know, we visited with them. Well, you learn uh, to communicate. I didn't. I couldn't speak, but you know, they speak enough broken different things, and and they use a little French, you know, and and so we could communicate. And yeah. then we would uh, like. I don't know if you ever messed with sea rations, but sea rations in the meal. There's a little package in there, 
and in it comes a pack of cigarettes, some toilet paper, some coffee, instant coffee, salt, pepper, that kind of stuff. Well, none of us smoke, so we'd always give those cigarettes to the Vietnamese, and they that was a big deal. You know, it's a little, it's just a little pack of about five cigarettes that would come in, but you got, you know, right. some every day. So there, you know, we trade them and. We did trade them out of a little rice just for a variety to go with our sea rations. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing what variety would do. Yeah, yeah. So what did you learn? I mean, those little interactions, what, it, what were they like, and what did you learn about the people or, or just the— Well, they were, they were friendly, and then uh, they were, it was kind of a loose nut. Like one of them even had some of his kids there, and, you know, and they come around. And it was interesting to see them and, and meet them and— talk to him and stuff, yeah. Have you ever been back to Vietnam? No, I never have. Do you have any desire to go? I I don't know. I never thought about it, I guess. I I guess I'd go if I had a chance. I don't know. I haven't. Right. Really, it hasn't been a big, big item on my list. Right. Was there ever any moments when you were over there that you thought, I might not come back? Oh, yeah, during attacks, you didn't know, yeah. Right. Yeah. What did you... Uh, d- during those moments, do you... Is there anything in particular that you think about or you you wonder about? Well, you just point, you know, is is this one, you know, yeah. or is it going to hit, you know? Yeah, yeah. But uh, when you were over there, let's let's talk about some of the things that y- you traded. You brought something, and I'd like you to to hold them up for me. Uh, I want you to tell me about the sandals. Can you show? Those are the most amazing things I've. <laughs> yeah, these are just um, these sandals made out of tires, and the straps are from tire inner tubes, and we used them as just sandals or like to go to the shower and stuff right. like that. We referred to them as Ho Chi Minh sandals. That was the nickname. Ho Chi Minh sandals. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And they uh, they look like, because they've still got some, they, you can actually see the tread and the lining. The, oh, yeah, the, yeah. The yeah. pile of, of the tire. Yeah. Uh, these are never going to wear out. Oh, you're, my you're, God, no. Well, the only thing that's going to happen, one of these. Stretch. You know, these are 50, over 50-some 50 years old right, right now. And I did have one of these these straps. The rubber got rotten and broke. Right. And I, I don't know if you could, well, I how they get them through that slit i don't know but they did but so that would be the only thing that would ever happen be now did you have to did they make those for you or did no, you just you had just had you just went and bought a pair huh. that's the way it went yeah. about how much that, is that going to cost you running in vietnam oh Here golly i don't remember what they huh. were they weren't much they were probably a buck or something wow you know they weren't much no yeah. no well everybody had them <laughs> And uh, I, I, I'm just, uh, those are marvelous because they've got the tread on it. And yeah. I, yeah. They, they're really obvious what they're made of after yeah. you're explaining, but you yeah. just, they kind of look just like a normal pair of sandals. And then I, I was kind of, kind of in, uh, in awe over it when I walked through that Smithsonian there. They had a pair there. Ho Chi Minh sandals. Yeah, I, uh, I took a picture of the ones I seen at the Smithsonian when I, uh, I give my little talk to my daughter's class. I, sh- I, sh- I said, here's the real thing. There they are in the Smithsonian. <laughs> right. So uh, something well, to relate to. When you, why do you, uh, be, I understand it's your daughter who asks you to come and speak yeah. to the class. Yeah. Why do you do it? Oh, well, to help her out. But it's, it's kind of fun, you know, the, mm-hmm. uh, some of the questions the kids have, some of the things they, uh, you know, uh, I always remind them, you know, that, when I was doing that, I was the same age they are. I was, you know, we're, we're at this, we were 18, 19, 20-year-old people, you know, same as these college kids are. And, right. You know, and then, you know, I can, this is what we did. This is how we lived. Uh, you know, you guys can relate. I don't know if they can relate to right. what we did or whatever. And I just, you know, I just show them the, the countryside and the people and, and these things like these sandals and and explain to them what my job was and, and I just go through that PowerPoint, basically, and explain the, the pictures, you know, like the ammo dump being blown up and the different things that we lived in. And, and uh, well, like just like you know, I told you about the electricity, how, uh, you know, there's not a lot, there wasn't a lot of, well, we didn't have a lot of, I mean, there was no TV, there was none of that stuff. There was just uh, light bulbs and some of that kind of stuff. Right. And, and water, you know, there was, you just carried water in cans. Outside of like when they run the showers, it wasn't you didn't you didn't have running water in place. You had to carry it and and then you would dump it in a wash pan if you wanted to wash up or cup if you wanted to drink or brush your teeth or you know that kind of stuff. Wow. You could get some we could get some sodas through the PX system and and once in a while some places we were they'd have a club where you could buy 
uh, you know, they limit you to two or three beers a day or something like that. And right. Was there any good beer or drinks in Vietnam? Well, it was all, you know, brought in, right. you know, United, you know, from the United States. It was, right. no, there was no local that I, now maybe there was some place if you could get into some of the towns, you know, like the people could go into Da Nang or Saigon or some of those places. I suppose they experienced it, but I was always out in some re remote location, so I never, I never had that experience, you know. Yeah. What, uh, what is the question that you get asked a lot by high schoolers? What do they want to know? Oh, there's there's a lot of different ones. Ones want to know what you've seen, what you did, how you felt about the people, mm -hmm. uh, just all kinds of different things. I had here, well, I want to show you this. This is kind of a couple things that I always use. But anyway, I at one of my reunions, I got a copy of this propaganda leaflet that the United States would 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 drop. Yep. You know. Yep. Well. The unique thing was there was, I can show it to you, there happened to be a young lady that was Vietnamese in my daughter's class. So she she translated it for me. She translated it, and it says, uh, bring this ticket to the state government. You will have good service, safe security, and everyone will be equal. This ticket can be used in all administrative units, political, military, socialist, Republic of Vietnam, and allied strength. So this is, this is a pass to... This they, is they a would, past. They would drop that in, you know, out in the country for the to try and get them to to come over to our side, you know. And, and wow. anyway, I, I was kind of impressed that that young girl was Vietnamese from Vietnam, and you know, and she translated for me. And she was interesting. She, uh, you know, wanted to know what I'd thought of their country, and you know how I would. It has really, it has really changed. Uh, we had a in Da Nang. There was a place called China Beach. I don't know if you ever heard mm -hmm. of that. Well. We got to go in. I went in there once. One day, they took us from Hill 55. We went in there for an afternoon. And there they had some beers, and you could get a burger and stuff like that. And we, we went in there once. But anyway, today, a guy sent me a, a deal on the uh, Internet. They have converted that China Beach into a world-class golf course that's really, I mean, one of the big things in that area in the Pacific Rim. Hmm. And it's, you can't believe it. You wouldn't right. even recognize it. Yeah. Yeah. What do you so when you when she asked what did you think of the people and what did you think of of the country what did you tell her? Well, I said that the country was beautiful and I told her. Of course, I didn't interface with the people. The ones I did were were fine. I had no problem with them. And the the country, like you see in the pictures, it was a beautiful country. I mean, most of it. There was, right. you know, some of the places were hot, pretty muddy and hot and right. dry. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's um, uh, when you when you look back at at the experience, uh, one of the things that the the soldiers have all told me, the the vets have all told me, is you know the, it changed them. They didn't think that it was, but it 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 changed them. Some they think for better, some they think for worse. How did how did Vietnam change you, and, and was oh, it good or bad? It it didn't. Yeah, it changed. You got a different outlook. You you're more focused. Whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. You know that was another thing I was going to mention too. You know, you hear so many stories about. Vietnam, they come back and they're turned into, you know, they're derelicts. Or, mm -hmm. Well, you know, I didn't, ex the people that I was with, I, you know, yeah, I got, uh, you know, I worked for the phone company for 40 years. I got a friend that was an electrician. One guy started his own heating and uh, air conditioning, done very, very well. Another guy is a building contractor in Houston, Texas. You know, one guy was a lineman. These guys all went on to lead. Another friend of mine was a, uh, when I got a college degree in zoology and ran a fish hatchery in Georgia, and you know, right? They, they weren't. Now maybe maybe some of them did that I don't know about, but right, the ones but that I've kept in contact with and whatever they've all come out of it positive, I guess. Yeah, and yeah. you did too. It yeah. Like. Yeah. What, what, tell me about the uh, the bombing on the ammo dump because th there's some pretty incredible photos. What what happened there? Well, they, their incoming rounds hit the ammo dump, and and all that ammo just started blowing up. It went on for over a day. Wow. What it, I imagine that. Yeah. See, I was probably a mile away from it. We could hear the noise, see the smoke. Right. But yeah, it just yeah they blew up the ammo dump, and so there went, of course, you know all the a ammo supplies that they had reserved. So. Were you worried? I mean, if oh, your ammo dump blows up, you're you're yeah. you don't have ammo. Yeah, that leaves you the kind of vulnerable. That, the only thing that you know, there's some spread out around the different places, and then, as I showed you, that 
Quaviet River, those boats, I mean, they could go out and meet supply ships and, and get something back in there in pretty short order, but nothing nothing really became of it big, but it was in the back of your mind, yeah. Yeah, that, that uh, yeah. uh-oh, well, there goes the supply. Yeah. I bet it was quite a show. Oh, my God, yeah, yeah. Because there, there's a lot of ammo there. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, and you Fire can see smoke. By that smoke and stuff, and, you know, and like I say, it went on for close to a day doing that. Wow. Uh, yeah, when it went up. Wow, I imagine it was kind of a spectacle for, oh, for yeah. the soldiers who were oh, there, yeah. just oh, kind yeah. of watching this. Oh, yeah. Uh, you also have an interesting picture there of uh, B-52s bombing, you know, yeah. kind of in an alignment. That was, what was that like? Tell me tell me about that. Well, that that picture, see, we were in Dong Ha, which is, what, I don't know, four or five miles, not just below the DMZ. And that was actually on the close to the DMZ where they were the B-52s were dropping their bombs. Oh, yeah, you could, like, if they did it at night, you could feel it shake and and hear it yeah what did it sound like just just kind of a dull roar yep huh. yeah just and, it, and you could see it in the how far away are you when you see where this is i mean how no, far oh you? that was probably three or four miles away yeah. right yeah. and that's still a lot of smoke oh of yeah smoke. oh yeah yeah they rain thunder yeah wow tell me about when you when you left the country uh let's talk about you leaving the country what was that like and do you remember that oh yeah oh yeah i remember it i was of course you're always happy to be going home 13 months, right? Yeah, yeah you're happy. So what did, what, what, what was your 13, what was your Darrow State? What was that? What, I, what, November, I went home. November, okay. Yeah, November of 67, yeah. And uh, how does that work? You get your orders that you're going back? Yeah, you get then, your orders, you're going back home, and then you, they fly you. Of course, I was at Dong Ha, and then I had to fly to uh, Da Nang, and then, and that was there. They kind of group you together, the people, and then, then you got an airplane, you know, that flight out of there back to uh, Okinawa, and then you were there about a day, and then you got your uniforms back out of, uh, your dress uniforms back out of storage, and, you know, got that cleaned up, and then you flew from there to, we flew back to El Toro, and then you got relieved to go on, on leave for, I can't remember, I think it was on leave for three weeks or something like that, then right. I go home, yeah. Yeah, that must have been uh, that must have been a good. What was it like leaving Vietnam? That flight well, from it Vietnam? was it was <laughs> it was kind of exciting because um, a lot of times you know they had a just a, one of those steel mat air strips at Dong Ha, and a lot of times that was a target, you know. Right. So when you were getting in an airplane, you was a little bit nervous, you know. And then I always remember that we were getting ready to go, and we got in this C-130, and we got to the end of the runway, and something happened to it. And then they had to go back and get into the aircraft, you know, and then there's, but then I always, I don't know, I'll never forget this. I always remember there was several uh, killed Marines in body bags in the flight too, you know. Huh. And, uh, you know, I remember looking at, you know, looking, you know, I'm going home okay and they're not, you know. I just, it did, that kind of, I was kind of, yeah, well, yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah. It was interesting to see that. And they were right there, the, the, oh, they yeah, were right there with you. Yeah, we're, I don't know if you've ever been one of the aircraft, but they're just little, canvas seats down the side of it and then the, all the cargo goes in the middle between you and then they were just on the floor of the aircraft and we were sitting on the sides and mm. wow and uh, yeah that so so they had a switch aircraft you got off one and then they moved them and then we got on when we got it was a pretty big relief when we lifted off <laughs> yeah i imagine what was the what was it like inside the uh, cabin there well it you, it was you know everybody was happy but they're so noisy. Most of them, the windows were broke out of them. I mean, you couldn't yell and and to somebody that close, and they couldn't hear you. You know, right. it, it, the noise would just. So there was no talking or yelling or anything like that. It was just. Yeah. If you can, you know, you could just see the relief on the guys' faces. Yeah, yeah. And then you go back and you get your dress uniform. Yep. Yep. And, and come home. Yep. Did it feel like you'd put that away forever ago? Oh, no. No, or did it seem right? Yeah. Yeah. And then you went home, and then what did you do at home? What was, uh, when you got home, then then you still had another year? Did well, you have- no, I had, a, I had uh, that was in, I got home in November, and I got out the next September. So I went home, and then, then I got married. My wife, okay. we'd been engaged since before I went to Vietnam. So we had her, got married, and uh, then I went to Camp Pendleton, California, and then I was just with a unit there until I was uh, relief from active duty and uh so you were engaged what was being engaged in vietnam like that must have been tough well yeah it was that's another thing you know uh, that i i tr- 
express to these college kids, you know, the only thing we had was letters. Yeah. There was nothing. You know, and you wrote a letter, and the turnaround was, you know, three weeks or better or something. And that's, and you know, in a good situation. If you were out in some remote location, they might, have got, might not have got your mail in for a few days or out. You know, I might write a letter, and it may lay there in the postal or whatever for who knows, you know. So right. there was a pretty good lapse between, you know, it's not like today they can text, which is great. I'm, I'm all for that. I'm, it's great that these people can communicate. But, you know, now they can email and text and, you know, like the kids in Iraq and whatever. They, they're keeping a pretty good touch, which is good. Right. But no, every- that, that had to be kind of a little lonely at times, right? Oh, yeah. But that's what you did. I mean, everybody did it. And that's just the way it was, you know. You just accept. Yeah. It. So you didn't get any special perks as a radio technician. You no, didn't no, get. There's no. no there's no. no, no. All, all of your communication. They had a radio thing uh, called the Mars Radio that would get you back to the United States, but that was for extreme emergencies, death in the family, or something. You could get on there and talk to people if need be. You know, of course, I never. But right. you know, that was very, very extreme. You. You didn't use that. Nobody was calling up to see how things were going at home. That, yeah, just kind of, hey, how, how's yeah, life? Yeah, no, that, yeah. that didn't happen. What were, When you did communicate back home, what what are, kind of things did you communicate about, and what did you hear back from people here? Well, you just tried to let them know your day-to-day life. and you did, I mean, you didn't expound on what, what the bad part of it. You just, you know, well, everything's going okay, and, you know, so-and-so's going home today. And, see, we were in... I went over as a replacement, mm-hmm. and so, you know, the unit had come to Vietnam in in uh, '65. So I, I went over as a replacement personnel. Well, there was always somebody coming, always somebody going, because in that type of deal, you know. Right. So there was always one of your friends was either getting ready to go home or or a new guy showing up and that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 And and uh, toward the end. Uh, how that last month must be hard, knowing. Oh yeah, and the, the closer you the closer you get to going home, the more tense you are and the more excited. And yeah, yeah. It does everybody knows their date? Oh yeah. Well, no, you don't know exactly. You know, it just uh, when you start getting, you know, you know about when you're going to go within a you know a week or so. But it, then it just comes when the orders get there and they got to. I suppose they must be setting up the flight somehow. I'm sure somebody. I didn't know what was going on, but somebody must be. Doing the logistics? Yeah, yeah. There, there had to be some logistics to it. They just didn't ship up. You know, they had to ship so many people at a time to to fill an aircraft to go back. You know, I mean, they had to have. I'm sure they had something figured out there. They right. Or it wouldn't have worked. You know. Right. So yeah, that's you just kind of waited, and all of a sudden they come and tell you, okay, your orders are here. You're out of here. And did you ever wonder? You know, you're a guy from V or from Haver uh, originally in Culbertson and and. And you sign in kind of at a peacetime, and all of a sudden you're in Vietnam. Do you ever think to yourself, how the heck did I get from Montana to Vietnam? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, well, just the way, you know, um, we were in the service. That was our job. You were, uh, you signed on to be in the military, and right, that, that's what happened, you know. Yeah. At the same time, you know, when I was at Camp Lejeune, that Dominican Republic thing heated up, and some guys got sent there. I never got involved there, but... You know, so there's actually a couple things all of a sudden start. So there's always action somewhere. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, I never got on one, but at Lejeune, a lot of the people went on cruises to the Caribbean and the Mediterranean, which would have been fun, I would have thought, you know. The, right. The training, you know, you got on a naval vessel and, and a unit and went and right. gone for two or three months. But I, I never had to do that. Never huh. got to do it. But but then when it comes to go to Vietnam, that's what I did. <laughs> right. You got a trip to Vietnam out of the deal. Yeah. 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 What's the, um, uh, what do you miss about home when you're over there? What did you miss about Montana or, or, or one of the two communities that you're, you're from? Well, of course, the food, I guess. And, yeah. You know, and, and you're, you know, just your, your parents, your loved ones, you know, you just miss being around them and whatever. But, yeah. But, but yeah, nothing. I guess. Did, did the scenery look a lot different? Was it totally yeah. foreign to you? Yeah, it was yeah, a lot more vegetation mm-hmm. than Montana. A lot of vegetation, uh, and the extremes. You know, we get the monsoon rain. It would rain and rain, and then in, when it was hot, the hot season, it would be like 110 or so. You know, it was extremely hot, and of course there was there was no air conditioning or nothing. You know, right. we did have a that bunker. We did have a fan. That was it. You know, but it. I don't know if you noticed that there's not much uh, little bitty windows. You know that they had to 
the fire out of from when it was a French bunker. There just wasn't a lot of ventilation. Right. So it, you know, it got that got hot. And yeah. How did you beat the heat? Was there any way? No. You just you just learned to live with it. Right. Sweat a lot. A lot. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, a lot. What, what, what? Uh, was there any particularly f- uh, particular food or, or, or something that you said, man? If, if I'm getting home, that's the first thing I'm having, or I would kill to have that that oh, over here. Of course, you know we all, you know, America. We always would it be fun to get a burger, you know, or something. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, so you miss the you miss the common things. Yeah, Dave. yeah, just the basic common things of everyday life. Yeah. When you came back for that three weeks, uh, kind of that that break, what what did you do? Well, I just was home, and, and of course I was getting married, so I had we had all the prep for that. It must have been nice being back home. Oh yeah, it was. Yeah, you know. What did what did uh, family and friends say? When, well, when they, they could tell that I was I was changed, and I was mm-hmm. tense, and you know, yeah. and it took me a while to settle down and stuff you know yeah right right uh so you just come back you, when when a soldier comes back especially from vietnam they're they're more tense is well, that what? i was i mean most people i think are probably yeah yeah what did you um do you are you still do you still think uh, at times that you have some some uh are there certain things that that I don't want to say trigger, but are there certain things that that you still don't like, or that you still feel yourself doing reflexively from Vietnam? No, nah, I don't. No, I don't have any. I don't feel like I got any of the PTSD that you right. know, some of them. And I can, you know, everybody's different. Everybody. Sure. I mean, everything you do, everybody's going to take it differently. How you take something, how I take it, it's going to be different, you know. Yeah. And and no, I. I got a couple guys that it was. They they claim they're having a little problem with it. I most of them don't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you come back, you you do your time. Was it hard for you to get back into after your discharge? Was it hard for you to kind of get back into life, civilian life? Yeah, it was. It was. It, well, it was different for me. You know, I I went. I got back, and I I was fortunate enough to get a job within about. A, Three weeks after I got out, you know. Wow. And and so you know it was different. The the pace was different. Uh, I was in the military. You know, you're you're being told what to do. You're expected to do things. You know, it, it, you just don't sit around. You know, and, and these guys were calm and whatever. And it, that that kind of had a took me a while to get used to that pace. You know? Right, right. It was a much slower pace, not well, as demanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you know, and then they could kind of take things as they went. And you know, I mean, you had your job to do and everything, but it wasn't. The pace and the environment that I was, you know, after four years in the military, was used to. Right. What's the? Um, uh, are there s- movies or film or songs or stuff that that you think capture what Vietnam was really like? I mean, there's been so much put out about Vietnam. Well, yeah. There's uh, there's some of them that are that are pretty good. Others, okay. pretty phony, you know. Right, and you can spot those. I oh, imagine yeah. pretty quick. Yeah. What's um, uh, let's talk about as you look at it. How do you now? Now that that's the, as you said, those those uh, those Ho Chi Minh slippers are almost uh, uh, sandals are almost fifty years old. Now now that you've been away for almost fifty years, how do you look back and how do you view this the Vietnam War as a guy who is there? Well, I I you know you. Like I say, we were in the military. That was our job. We did it. Um, I, I, on that PowerPoint, I don't know. You'll, you'll get to see it. Um, we could bring. Well, we can't bring that up. But anyway, um, it's funny. Uh, my daughter helped me look up some stats, mm-hmm. and it showed like the percentage of Vietnam veterans that were okay with what they did, and it's, mm-hmm. it's high. It's up there, pretty high. And then the percentage that said they would do it again mm-hmm. is very high yeah and then it also said this is a very interesting statistic to me that 60 um, some percent of the Vietnam were volunteers where only 30 some percent of the people that went to World War II were hmm. I found that I didn't think you know because I thought boy World War II you all you read about is people flooding the the recruiting offices and everything to go you know, the, right? Because that was a you know they invaded the country and it really had people fired up. Right. And I I just was surprised to read that stat that 
that many more Vietnamese uh, Vietnamese veterans volunteered than than World War II. I, yeah, I found that. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I don't know it. Uh, you know, you can see now that it probably wasn't. I here's something I I yeah. I cut out. This is an article from your paper here, the Gazette, in 2004, right when when the United States invaded uh, Iraq. Mm -hmm. They interviewed that General Gape, who was a general of North Vietnam. Yeah. And and he says right here, he says, nations that impose their will on others will certainly face defeat. Yeah. And, you know, we went in there trying to change those people, and I think we tried to do the same thing in Iraq and Afghanistan. You you don't, those people, they've been that way, for, you're not going to change them. Right. I mean, we come in there thinking, well, you know, you got to be like us. Well, they don't. Right. And, and they don't want to. Right. They just want to be left alone. Yeah, and so you see some parallels between between yeah. the two. Yeah. 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 I always, uh, <laughs> always kind of kid these kids, but... Uh, I always tell them, I says, the United States didn't didn't really realize in Vietnam if they were going to be involved over there or if they wanted to be committed, really committed to that war, you know? Right. And you know the difference between involved and committed? I, I've heard the joke, but yeah, you yeah. Tell, tell it. Yeah, with the, the eggs and bacon, yep. you know, the chicken's involved, involved it's committed. committed. <laughs> right, exactly, that's what... Yeah. 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 So that's... Um, so looking back, and, and what do you what do you hope... When people look back, now we're looking back at 50, but let's take this up another 50 years. In 100 years, what do you hope people remember about Vietnam from someone who was over there? Well, I hope they appreciate what we did. We, you know, we went for the right reasons to try and stop communist aggression and, and help the people and, and do all that. And I hope they, that, you know, don't look at us like a lot of them baby killers or something, you know. Right. You know, I mean, we, we were... American servicemen doing our, our duty, you know. Right. And right. And uh, and uh, when you look back uh, 50 years, and when you tell uh, when you tell uh, students about it, uh, what do you think their what what are their reactions? Well, some of them are in, you know interested in what you did and why you did it, and you know they have comments about you know the pictures of where we lived and mm -hmm. where we did, and then, then they want to know you know what I thought of it, and uh, mm -hmm. and you know I tell them just like I tell you I, we were doing our job, and yep. I mean I had no real anim the people were fine, and what what interfacing I had with them I wasn't with them all the time, but right, but uh, at the end of your duty in '68. The public sentiment, 1968, is usually looked at as a year where public sentiment about Vietnam started to change pretty oh, yeah, drastically. It was pretty bad, yeah. Uh, started to erode. What was that like as a guy who had been there, done his service, oh, and yeah, now yeah. out? What was? Yeah, it bothered you. You know, yeah. you know these, you know, you don't know unless you're there. Right. You know, I mean, how can you know and how can you say and, you know, and to, to go against people that are trying to do what's right, you know. Yeah, and I don't know. Maybe they had some right. I don't know, but yeah, it was. I didn't. You know, a lot of people, even when they come home in '67, I had friends that, you know, in the travels home and stuff, encountered people that were, you know, spoke against them and whatever. I didn't. Mm -hmm. Coming back to Montana, I didn't really. Right. Have anybody that. Well, what was your arrival back in Montana like? Well, I just. Flew in, and uh, there my parents and my fiance were there to meet me at the airplane, and you know that's got to be a pretty good feeling. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was yeah. good. To, you were glad to be back home. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah you're glad. To and be. then you were married shortly after. Yeah. 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 Well, that was great. Yep. Uh, what am I missing? What else am I? What I'm? I'm sure you know. It's it's always hard. I've I've said in these interviews. You know, tell me about all the tell me about war in an hour or so, and it's it's, yeah. it's kind of I you know oh, yeah. it's 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 a fool's errand. But am I missing anything, or is there any experiences yeah. that I haven't hit on for you, Ralph? No, oh, I I just try and well, I I got this. I can I this watch. I uh, this is my my little uh, thing that I I guess I told you about my my radio relay training, going to schools, the trigger finger thing I did, and then. Um, I don't know if anybody, you know, Vietnam is, is divided into four areas during the war yep. from the north to the south. And we were in, always in them, what they called, it was the one, it was called the I-Corps. That's where the Marines were always in the I-Corps yep. up on the DMZ. That's where we were. And about the radio, really, how we had the wires hooked to the switchboards and, and the USO shows that I didn't get to see Jane Mansfield. I just got a picture, but I did get to go see Nancy Sinatra. 
How was Nancy Sinatra? Good. Yeah? That was fun. That was fun. And uh, I do remember it uh, when I was at Amwa. We did get to go down for, for a, they cooked us a big Thanksgiving dinner. I did get the, we got a break in the sea rations for that. And then I was, Christmas and New Year's, I was at a hill, that hill 282 outside of Da Nang. And, and we did get, they did try to fly us in a meal. Right. And the choppers couldn't land because it was, it was foggy and stuff. So a couple of us went down below the hill, and it was just a cooler. We called them back cans back, and had to carry the meal back up to the hill. But wow. it was just us. See, there was us three radio relay people, and then there was a squad of infantry for security for us because we was on top of the hill, and that's what there was up there. So anyway, that was, that was Christmas. And then we, then we went back, and... Uh, to Dong Ha, I mean Da Nang, and then I mean Hill Five Five, and then after that we went to went to Dong Ha, and then that's where I was the rest of the time. Now, like you know, I had trips like to, I was taking radio gear down to that mouth of the Quad Viet. That's why I rode mm -hmm. the boats. One day I went up to Camp Carroll on the rock pile, and just different right. things like that. You know. How how hard was it to find parts? I mean, would that take you kind of on these wild goose chases, or yeah, can you? Can sometimes you... it was, sometimes it wasn't. Yeah, you just didn't know what was available. Sometimes things were pretty readily available. Other times you. Yeah. So how did you find? Let's say you needed a certain part. How did you find it? Because there's no internet and there's no, no texting, no, and you just had to go back. You always had kind of a repair shop with your unit. You could go to them and. You know, there was a network, you know, right. you know, even though there's no Internet, you'd, you'd be surprised how, what kind of network there is for, for the people. It, it, yeah. And then. Yeah, communication. I get told you about communicating the letters, uh, the experience of coming home. Yeah, it's something I'll never forget. I'll never. I, yeah. You know, you? just like in preparation for this, you know, I get to look at those pictures. A lot of those memories and people come back, you know. Yeah. Yeah, they seem like they're pretty good, all, all in all, good memories. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you, you, I guess you kind of try to forget about them. <laughs> right. I mean, it was, you know, it was not, a, you can see our living conditions were, were pretty pretty grim. Right. And then when we got, you know, attacks and stuff, it was pretty tense. And the food was, the food was pretty yeah, it was it, that wasn't any big deal. Yeah, the yeah. sea rations got, but you got by. You you learned to make the most of it. it you, yeah, you just adapt. You know, you just adapt. That seems to be a pretty good lesson. Do you think you yeah. became more adaptable in oh, yeah. life? Oh yeah, yeah. You just learned to roll with things and take it as it comes. Did you look when you got back to America? Did you you talked about how you saw Vietnam and and saw some of the how they lived and all that? Did you see America differently when you came back? Well, I don't know how to say that. I guess. I mean, yeah, you kind of appreciated mm -hmm. what we have here in this country. Yeah. You know, yeah, I think that's a common way of life. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a pretty good way of life, even as screwed up as maybe some. And then we have a lot of problems, as you know, in this right. age. But it's still a lot better than. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. It's way ahead of a lot of places. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I really thank you for sharing your story, yeah. and and most of all, on here too much. No, you didn't. Absolutely not. In fact, you pretty pretty quick. I also want to thank you for your service. I yeah, thank, thank you, you for willing to go and and to do that, and uh, I thank you for willing to share your story because it's it's important that we preserve these. So, this has uh, been the Billings Gazette's Vietnam Voice series, and I have been uh, honored to be with uh, Ralph Kinney today. Thanks, Ralph.